All right, well, thanks. Um, that was a nice introduction. Thanks, Chris. So today I'm going to talk about pulmonary ultrasound, and um, this is a relatively new field, although in Europe it's been going on a lot longer than we've been doing it in America. Uh, there are actually some intensive care units in Europe who don't use chest X-ray for very much at all. They use ultrasound to uh, look for pneumonia, pneumothorax, line placement, endotracheal tube placement. They use ultrasound for all of that. And it's just now catching on here in America in the last, say, decade, that we understand that you can actually ultrasound the lung. The um, prior understanding, for, and I know all of you have had this multiple times, is that air doesn't transduce ultrasound well, so how could you possibly you know, ultrasound image the lung? Well, what I'm going to teach you today is that we don't so much look at the lung as we look at the artifacts created by the ultrasound waves that travel through the lung. And that tells us a lot about what's going on with the underlying tissue. So there's a classic differential diagnosis that we see all the time. Um, you will see it your first time in the hospital. Somebody presents short of breath, and the question is, what's going on here? So if you have a patient who has a 56, who's 56 years old, who smokes, who has a bad heart, and the differential is wide, but it definitely includes on the, at the top of the list congestive heart failure and COPD exacerbation. So that's always the, the clinical dilemma is, which one is it, congestive heart failure or COPD? And historically, we didn't have a good way of knowing because sometimes the chest X-ray is not you know, adequate to tell us which one it is, and sometimes it can be both because um, patients are allowed to have two diseases. Um, so sometimes we don't know how to treat these patients, and what we've done is we give them medications for the CHF, we give them medications for the COPD, and we hope something sticks, and we hope it works. But it, it is very um, powerful now that we know how to use ultrasound to be able to focus what we do and, and actually give them the therapy that is directed at what the underlying problem is instead of just shotgunning the therapy. So that, the, the lung ultrasound is very much based in evidence. There's a big body of evidence now that's the, and it's growing on how we can use ultrasound for um, imaging the lungs. We know that chest X-ray is inferior, and in other words, ultrasound is superior to X-rays for differenti differenti differentiation excuse me, of CHF from COPD. There are several other things uh, that, we, that we know from the, from the evidence, which is we can adequately look at alveolar interstitial syndromes, which in other, way, in other words is uh, pulmonary edema and variants of that, um, pneumothorax, pneumonia, COPD, pleural effusions, hemothorax, I can read you the list, you can read it yourself. But not only can we, can we appreciate diagnoses on ultrasound, but we can also um, guide our procedures and our imaging uh, during procedures to in increase patient safety. All of this has been well worked out. Um, there's some key probe positions which you'll be practicing today in your practical sessions, but it's also a good habit to get into um, to look at all eight key probe uh, positions on the chest. There's four on each side. And in what we're looking at, if you delineate the chest as far as the sternum, the anterior axillary line, and the posterior axillary line, you divide up the chest into four areas on each side. And you want to look at a, a representative area in each segment so that you can feel like you've had a good overall picture of what's going on with the chest. This patient is lying down. Most of the patients you'll see in the hospital are lying down. Um, that we ultrasound, although it is possible to image the, the back. And what we're, what we're teaching you today is primarily we focus on the anterior because there are some, um, there's gravity and essentially if you're on your back for any length of time, any kind of fluid in your lungs will go to the back and you'll get false positives. So we really want to image the front and the sides to, to tell us uh, what, what is going on in the lung. Anteriorly is the best place to look for pneumothorax, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if you think about it, if you're supine and you have air that has escaped from inside the lung into the pleural space, where is it going to be if you're on your back? It's going to be anterior, right? Um, and posterior laterally, we can best see effusions, which is fluid that's in the pleural space, and consolidations, which are you know, pneumonias or atelectasis of the lung, posteriorly because those are gravity dependent. All zones, though, you can appreciate pulmonary edema. Um, pulmonary edema, in, in very rare circumstances, will be unilaterally, but in most cases, this is due to congestive heart failure or um, a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It's going to be bilateral. And so you should be, when you're trying to identify pulmonary edema, being able to see it in multiple fields. 
very briefly, the probe selection, you know, ideally we use the curvilinear probe, but it depends on your patient's body habitus. You can use the um, high frequency linear probe and you can also use the cardiac probe. Um, a lot of it depends on whether you're looking for the forest or the trees. If you're going to look for the big picture, you start with the low frequency probe that gives you a deeper view. And then when you're looking for the detail like we do when we um, look at pneumothorax, then you pick up the high frequency probe and you get more detail. So you'll see examples of both of that. A couple quick tips, and this, um, this is important for any kind of imaging, is if you don't have a great picture, if you don't see anything, basically you have to think about well, what you know, troubleshoot. Do you have enough gel? You know, air is your enemy, gel is your friend. You've probably heard that a thousand times, but it's, it is absolutely true. If you don't have gel, you don't have good contact with the chest wall, or if you've got something obstructing in the way, you have a bandage or a bra strap or something like that, you need to clear those things so that you can see. You may need to reposition the patient. Um, and you also have to consider is the reason you can't see anything is because there's air in the tissues or air in the thorax, like a pneumothorax, and it's obliterating your image, and that tells you something too. So looking at the uh, overall picture is important. Very quickly, I'm going to review lung anatomy. I know you've all had this on histological and gross levels, but uh, the lung is divided, and we're really interested in what's at the periphery of the lung. The terminal bronchioles branch into the alveoli. These are divided off from each other in interlobular septi. Um, and so if you look at that histologically, this is a normal lung. You see the terminal bronchiole and all of the little alveolar sacs off the end. This is what it appears like in pulmonary edema. So you can see that the air is replaced by fluid. You'll also notice that the interstitium in the picture of pulmonary edema is quite a bit thicker than the interstitium in, an, in a normal lung, and that's going to be important uh, to, to note. Um, looking back at the picture, the pleural line of the, it is also sometimes referred to, you'll hear it referred to as a VPPI, which is a visceral parietal pleural interface. It basically just means where the visceral and the parietal pleura come together and they, they move on each other. So these terminal um, bronchioles go all the way out to the periphery of the lungs and the interlobular septa come up to the surface in a perpendicular fashion. That is important also to note because it will explain some of the artifacts we see in a moment. Also, most of the peop most people, these interlobular septa are about seven millimeters apart. It's not key that you understand and remember that number per se, but just approximate in your head about how far these, in these uh, structures are apart. So now that you remember what the lung looks like and we've talked about which probe to use, what you're really interested in is when you're looking at someone's lung, is it normal or not? And the way that we ascertain that is to look at look for some artifacts that, that are classic in certain situations. One is A lines and one is B lines. And of course, you're asking them what are A lines and what are B lines, and we're, we're going to explain all that. A lines are horizontal artifacts. They're repetitive. They're from reverberation due to ultrasound waves that have gotten trapped at the pleural line. So anytime you have uh, two things next to each other, two substances or tissues next to each other that have a really different acoustic impedance, for instance, floral line and air right next to it, you're going to have, that sets up a reverberation at that interface. The air, the ultrasound waves get trapped right there and they reverberate back and forth. And what happens is the probe reads that as a deeper structure. You can see A lines in normal lungs or in pneumothorax because A just means air. It doesn't tell you where the air is, it just tells you there's air. The air could be in the lung in a normal situation or it could be outside the lung in the pneumothorax. So to show you what we're looking at here, this is the chest wall. This is obviously a um, high frequency probe. This is the chest wall and then you have the ribs. The cortex of the ribs are bright white. The pleural line or visceral parietal pleural interface is just below, usually about a half centimeter below the ribs, depending on the patient's body habitus. And then down here you have this A line, which is just, and I'll take it away so you can see it. Do you see that reflection of the pleural line deeper? That's artifact, that's not really there. It's, it's the fact that ultrasound waves have gotten trapped in that bright white um, pleural line that has very different acoustic impedance than the air right underneath it. And it sets up a resonance back and forth and occasionally that resonance reaches, goes back to the probe and the probe sees, well, the signal took a little while longer to get back, so there must be something deeper that's creating that signal. So you will see these repetitive horizontal artifacts, and I'll give you some more examples. You'll also notice that the, um, the A-lines are spaced equidistant from the space from the chest wall down to the VPPI is, is the spacing that you'll see. And if you take the 
of the probe or increase the depth, you'll see that that spacing remains consistent throughout. Okay. <clears throat> Another example, just a reminder, the air is just not a good transducer, uh, transducer of sound. This, the sound will reach that pleural line there and it will just, most of it will scatter back. But the ones that do reach back to the probe in an organized fashion will create an image and that's the pleural line. However, some of those uh, sound waves reach the pleural line and they get stuck in the pleural line and they reverberate and they reach back to the probe later and it ends up in interpreting that as lines that are lower. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. It's just an artifact. Your line, the lungs are not striped. It's just, this is because there's air and the difference between the air and the pleural line is creating this artifact. Okay, so normal lung will have A lines. Also, pneumothorax will have A lines as well. So A line does not necessarily mean normal, but you will see A lines in normal lungs. Yes, you had a question? Um, does it depend on what frequency you use? It doesn't really depend on what frequency you use. You'll see this artifact because there's such a huge differ uh, difference between the acoustic impedance of the pleural line and the air next to it that there will be a resonance phenomenon with most any probe you pick. It, should, it doesn't change, it's still the same. Just the depth of the line is from the chest wall to the VPPI is the, is, a, is the spacing. You'll see multiples of that as it goes down, okay? Good questions. Um, so what, when you're wondering whether you have normal lung or not, you are looking for, well, are the A lines gone? Because if the A lines are gone, then that means there's not air there, that something else has replaced the air in the lung, and that could be anything, that could be blood. Uh, it could be edema, infection, contusion, tumor. Any number of things can obliterate the A-lines, and then you have to start thinking, what's, what has taken its place? So now we're going to get into what are B-lines. B-lines are actually vertical artifacts that erase the A-lines. So normal aerated lung has A-lines, but if you have B-lines, these are artifacts created by fluid in the lung that will obliterate the A-lines. So normally, these vertical comet tails, you can have, you can have a couple little ones that are normal. You can have up to four, some people say three, can be normal. But if you have multiple diffuse B lines in multiple fields, then that is abnormal. That is fluid that has overtaken the air in the lung. And you remember that histology picture we just showed you with the thickened interlobular septi and the fluid in the alveoli. It could also that that fluid is next to the air in the lung will create a reverberation, but the reverberation in that case is vertical and I'll explain why in just a moment. So here's an in motion picture of what B lines look like. Fluid is replacing the air. It looks like a light show. But, and you'll notice that there's multiple and they go all the way to the edge of the screen and they, the A lines have disappeared. Another example, these are finer B lines and there's a physiology behind why these look a little bit different than the others, which I'll touch on. So, the, the reason the B lines happen is, again, it's an artifact that you have to interpret what the artifact is because you can't actually see the lung. The sound waves are trapped in the fluid that's in the interstitium. Remember the interstitial um, walls, the interlobular septae, are about seven millimeters apart. When those get thickened with fluid, the sound waves get trapped in that interface and will create a reverberation. And the reverberation is vertical because those, those septae are vertical compared to the chest wall. They come all the way up to the chest wall perpendicularly. So as the ultrasound beam reaches that interface and creates a reverberation, it, it creates multiples of this reflection, and therefore you end up with a comet tail. You'll see two different types or, or natures of bee lines. One is the more gross appearance, where the, which is what you're seeing on the left there. Um, that is interstitial edema. Generally, that's fluid that's in the interlobular septi, but maybe not in the alveoli yet, but still it's, it's a fluid that's not normally in the lung. And those tend to be spaced about seven millimeters apart up at the chest wall. The one that on the right that looks more fine and diffuse, that's when you progress from just interstitial edema into alveolar edema or ground glass or diff you know, more significant um, pulmonary edema so that the fluid is actually in the alveoli and that means the alveolar are spaced only about three millimeters apart so you have a, just a kind of a diffuse B line. Appreciate the difference there? 
So just to review, uh, the key findings when you have pulmonary edema or alveolar interstitial disease, which can also be, which can be cardiogenic, non-cardiogenic, and it could be uh, fibro fibrosis. There's many things that could create this, but essentially what it is is you don't have air, you have something else in the interstitium of the lung that's replaced the air, so you, your A lines are gone. And then you have comet tails that go all the way to the edge of the screen, multiple and in multiple fields. Just a few more examples, B lines versus A lines, the horizontal versus the vertical. And just some stills of different ways that the B lines can appear. Chest X-rays, um, if you've had any radiology, you'll, you will have heard the term curly B lines. And on a chest X-ray, a curly B line is this perpendicular to the chest wall opacity that represent pulmonary edema. So you can see the B lines on ultrasound and B lines on chest X-ray, same terminology, same, describing the same thing. So when, when you later on hear somebody refer to a chest X-ray that has curly B lines, that's a marker of pulmonary edema, and that's what they look like, and so you can imagine why they look the way they do on ultrasound. Okay. <clears throat> we're gonna move on. We'll have some time at the end for more questions about A and B lines. Um, but we're gonna move on to uh, ultrasound of pneumothorax. And just a reminder about what a pneumothorax is. Normally, your lung is inflated. It's like a balloon. It's covered with the visceral pleura, and the chest wall is covered with the parietal pleura, and normally they're adhered together, usually it's like, almost like a suction, a very thin layer of fluid between the two. And if anything, if any air gets in between those two layers, the, the lung will just collapse. You lose the suction. So a pneumothorax is when your lung has collapsed and air has, has entered the chest cavity instead. Pneumo meaning air, thorax meaning chest. So what about chest x-ray for pneumothorax? Um, you have a patient who's short of breath, you get this chest x-ray, it, it looks like the lungs are inflated, it couldn't possibly be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Loaded question, right? So if you get a, t a CT scan of this same patient on their back, you will notice that on the left side, and remember you're looking from the foot of the bed, the left chest, the lung has separated from the chest wall and has deflated. The upper lobe is completely deflated. You couldn't see that on chest x-ray. It's the same patient who was in that chest x-ray just the slide before. You couldn't appreciate that because when they're on their back, where is the air? Anterior. So if this person is laying down on their back, and they are by definition because this is a trauma film and you don't have trauma patients and see collars sitting straight up and talking to you, they're on their back on a backboard. You take a film, and if that air has escaped from the lung and is sitting in, in a bubble anterior to their heart or anterior to their uh, left lung, you're not going to see it. You can't see, you can't see any line. So CT scan has really had been the gold standard for a long time, but now ultrasound is gaining on that, and it's actually gaining a lot of favor because one, it's cheaper, it's safer, and it's faster. It's a lot faster. So we can very successfully um, ultrasound for pneumothorax. And so we'll talk about that. And what we're going to be doing is interpreting those artifacts to see if we have normal lung or not. There have been studies, uh, blunt trauma studies, that um, have compared CT or placement of chest tube with rush of air as the gold standard versus ultrasound and compared that to um, how chest x-ray it, it functions as far as a test. And chest x-ray is not as good as ultrasound. There's some studies that put chest x-ray at a coin flip, you know, 40% sensitive for pneumothorax in the supine position and some up to 75, but either way, if I was the patient on the bed, I wouldn't want to be in that 25% that they missed. So ultrasound is, is much better. If you, um, if you see the lung moving underneath the chest wall, then you don't have a pneumothorax, it's 98%. So the technique that we use to, to scan for pneumothorax is, um, we have to remember that the heart takes up a lot of the left chest and there's no lung in front of that heart in most patients. Some of our COPDers are the exception, but most patients the lung does not go in front of the heart. So you start at the, at the midclavicular, you use the high frequency probe again because we're looking very superficially, we're looking for the pleural line which is only a centimeter or two underneath the surface in, in some people. You choose the high frequency probe, you, you start in the second intercostal space. The orientation is towards the, the orientation marker is towards the head. Um, and you move 
move downwards anteriorly and then splay laterally so that you're getting images in all four quadrants. You have to do it a little bit more laterally on the left so that you avoid the heart. What you also want to do is when you put the probe on the patient, you want to watch them breathe through a few respiratory cycles because what we're trying to pick up here is, is the pleura moving? So you have the visceral line and the parietal uh, pleura together in a normal patient. And if you're breathing, then there's motion at that interface when you breathe. If your lung has collapsed, there won't be any motion at that interface because the, the lung is way down here. There's three big things you're going to look for with an pneumothorax. One is the pleural line. We just talked about that. The other is lung sliding. And the last is when you, you can put an M-mode line through the pleural line, put the, put the image in M-mode and watch over several respiratory cycles what happens through that line, and you can actually see whether the lung is moving underneath due to the, an artifact that it creates in the, on the M-mode. We have several examples of that. So again, your anatomy, identify your pleural line. Remember that you have the ribs, that, which also hyperechoic um, at the cortex, and there's usually rib shadows behind the ribs. Some people call this the bat sign, so that you have the cortex of one rib and the cortex of the other rib is the wings and the pleural line is the body. So you can uh, kind of see that. You're looking for that. That's what you want to see in your image. The rib on either side and the pleural line in the middle. Um, you may see A lines. If you do, does that mean you don't have pneumothorax? No, because A means air. It doesn't necessarily mean the air is inside the lung. It could be outside. You may see B lines if the patient has pulmonary edema. If you see B lines, do you think that the patient has a pneumothorax? Right. If you see B lines, the patient does not have a pneumothorax because B lines are originating from the, the interstitial edema that's from the lung. And so if you have lung in the field and it's up at the chest wall, then your lung is not collapsed by definition. So we'll show you some, some pictures of that. Um, when you have a pneumothorax, this interface is, is obliterated, essentially. You, you will have the parietal pleural line, but you will not see the, the motion of the visceral at the parietal line. Okay, so again, you use your hyperacoustic probe. You place it in a craniocaudal orientation, sagittal orientation, starting at the second inter intercostal space using the midclavicular line. You watch through s several modes of breathing, and you get this image in your picture, the pleural interface and the two ribs, and you see you're looking for the lung to slide back and forth as you breathe. And remember that the lung goes craniocaudal, so the best orientation to really catch it is when you're in the vertical orientation. So if the remember that air impairs transmission of sound. So when the lung is up, you will see sometimes very faint B lines, you'll see A lines. Um, but you won't see deep into the lung unless the lung is consolidated or something wrong with the lung. But you can see the pleural interface. You should be able to see that. You should be able to see sliding. However, if the lung has collapsed, that lung drops away. And you will not be able to get your ultrasound beam through that pocket of air to see anything underneath, including B lines. So even if the patient has pulmonary edema, you're not going to see it because there's air that's going to get in the way of your image. Everybody appreciate that, why it would be hard to see, and you wouldn't see the sliding. Okay, some examples. This patient is breathing. You can see a rib shadow on either side. You can see the pleural line, and you see some probably normal B lines, just very faint ones. But you can appreciate that there's movement at that, at that interface. Okay, rib shadow, ribs and rib shadows. And again, just in case we're not talking the same language, this is lung sliding and with some B lines underneath. This means that your lung is up. It's basically the visceral and parietal pleura are touching each other and you don't have a pneumothorax in that area where you're looking. Doesn't mean you don't have a pneumothorax somewhere else. You still have to be thorough and look in all the eight quadrants, but that means that the place where you're looking, the lung is, is adhered to the chest wall. Okay. Pneumothorax, however, this patient is breathing, not holding their breath. So you do see some movement of the chest wall because the patient's intercostal muscles are still contracting, but as far as the sliding, you don't see anything anymore. Sliding appears to a lot of people, it's been described as marching ants or shimmering. So what you're looking for is, it looks like little tiny ants are marching along that line or that there's a shimmery effect. And if you don't see that, 
then you have to be concerned that the lung is not touching the chest wall. And that you can also appreciate there's no comet tail there, and there may even be the hint of an A-line there at the bottom of the screen. Okay. All right. Moving on. Just a couple examples. Is this lung sliding? So, pneumothorax or not? No. no. Good. You're experts now. <laughs> That's really all you need to know. Very easy to get the image. You will all be flying through this and then looking at kidneys and hearts later today because it's very easy to get the image. The other, okay, so we're moving on to the, the M mode. So if you put an M mode line through that interface, through the pleural line, and watch it over time, you end up having uh, an image that we call Sky Ocean Beach. You'll hear it also referred to as the seashore sign. Either way, the soft tissue creates a striped appearance. The pleural line is bright white, and that's kind of like the, the, where the ocean meets the land. And if the lung is sliding underneath that pleural line, you get a grainy effect due to the motion. You can't see the lung itself, but you can see the motion artifact. So basically that graininess is the beach, and that means the lung is moving, and it's in the picture. So that sky ocean beach is normal. If the lung has dropped, the beach disappears because you just basically have stripes the whole way down because all you're getting are reverberations from the soft tissue. You, don't, you can't see any lung, you can't see mo motion of the lung, so the beach drops out of the picture and you have a barcode or stratosphere sign. Okay, some examples. This is an end mode through the pleural interface with, uh, you, can, you can also appreciate, even though it hasn't gotten all the way across the screen, that you have very diff definite um, sky, ocean, with the pleural line being the, the horizon of the, where the ocean meets the land and a beach, more, more inferiorly. That's due to the motion of the, of the lung, okay? And by contrast, we have an upper picture where you can appreciate an A line, which tells you could be pneumothorax, could be normal, but then when you put an M mode through it, you have no beach, and this is a pneumothorax. Just looks like a barcode. So this is what we're looking for. In your models today, I'm sure nobody's gonna have a pneumothorax, but if you ask them to hold their breath very carefully, like when you're doing an M mode, get, get Sky Ocean Beach first, but then ask them to hold their breath and really you know, ask them not to move at all, and you'll, and you'll be able to see the stratosphere sign, the barcode. Because if the lung's not moving, you won't get that graininess. Sky Ocean Beach? Nope, pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay. Good job. Okay. Um, just another example of on the lower picture, a, a film with multiple A lines, and if, when you put the M mode through it, you have what definitely looks like a barcode, and the above picture where you can see the beach, the graininess of the beach due to the lung motion. And which one is positive? Right or left? Uh, Correct. It's very, yeah, it's very, once you understand what you're looking for and you can find that image, not a problem. And last example, which one is positive? Left. Nice job. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this, instead of wait, ordering a chest x-ray, waiting for the tech to come up, getting a film, waiting for someone to read it, 30 minutes later you get your answer. You can see how just putting a probe on the chest, you get your answer in 30 seconds, and you can really benefit the patient by knowing what's going on. Okay. One last thing I'm going to mention that's very specific to pneumothorax and actually is 100% diagnostic if you see it, although you may go your whole career and never see it. If you do, I want you to understand what it is you're looking at. It's something called a lung point. A lung point is literally the point at which the lung drops away from the chest wall. So if you get that rib space, where you have a rib on one side, a rib on the other, and the pleural line, if you get in that rib space where as the patient breathes, you can see sometimes the lung is up against the wall, the wall and sometimes it's not because the lung's moving and it's pulling that dropped away area into the picture, you will have in the same picture as the patient breathes, you'll have 
a lump point, this is the point where it drops, and on this side you have no slide and A lines periodically, and on the other side you have the sliding sign and comet tails, because this is where the actual point at which the lung falls away from the chest wall. 100% diagnostic, if you see this, this is a pneumothorax. Nothing else does this. Can anybody see that? Mm -hmm. And if you look at it from a CT point of view, if you're looking at this exact spot where the lung has fallen away from the chest wall, you can imagine you put an end mode through there, and sometimes you might see the lung up, and sometimes you might see it down as the patient breathes. Okay. One caution before we move on. Not, um, there, there are other things that can cause lack of sliding. So you also want to look at the clinical picture um, look at the uh, M mode and so forth. Sliding is not the only thing you want to look for. You want to look for B lines, A lines, and, and so forth, and really take a, a full uh, view before you make a decision because if a patient has a chest tube in, for instance, it's tacking down their lung, their lung won't slide when they're breathing. Or if they have a bleb or adhesions from a prior infection or you know, anything like that, sometimes the lung does not slide normally. But you would still be able to see B lines. You would still be able to see, um, you would still be able to see that a little bit of motion when you go on M mode, you would still be able to see that. Scyosha V should still be there. But lack of sliding, be careful. If you see lack of sliding, don't make your diagnosis just on that. Okay? All right, we're going to move on to fluid. So we now we've talked about air in the wrong area, air in the pleural space. We're going to talk about fluid in the pleural space and what that appears to be. So the best place to look for fluid is at the diaphragm on either side. So Fluid is dependent, a patient is supine, the fluid's gonna be falling into the costophrenic recess, the angle right there. So if you put your probe with the indicator towards the patient's head, right about where you think their diaphragm would be, you can identify it, everybody in here knows what the liver looks like, and the diaphragm is bright white right above the liver. The area right cranial to that, or towards the head, is the pleural space, and that's where we're gonna be looking. So, you can imagine, with the dot towards the patient's head, you have liver, diaphragm, pretty clear. And right above that, if you see blackness, what is black? What turns out black in ultrasound? Fluid. Fluid. Right. What does air look like in ultrasound? White. Air doesn't look white. Air, you can't see air. Air just scatters the picture, right? Air doesn't conduct ultrasound well. Um, so basically, if you have air, I'll show you what happens when you have air in just a moment. You get a different kind of picture. This is the space, again, where you're placing your probe, you're finding the liver, you're moving up and down so you can find that person's diaphragm, and this area is where you want to image. People's diaphragms are in different places. People don't necessarily read the textbook. COPDers have very low diaphragms because their lungs are hyperinflated. Some people have great big livers and their diaphragms are up in their armpits. So you need to look around and find out where the diaphragm is. Don't just assume. So here's a good example of, there's a little bit of picture of Morrison's pouch, kidney, liver, and right above the liver, you see black. It should not be there. That is a pleural effusion. And depending on the situation, it could be pus, blood, transudative fluid. That's more of a clinical diagnosis. But it's definitely fluid in the wrong place. By contrast, if you don't have fluid there, what happens to the air is it comes down through the liver, bounces off the diaphragm, reverberates a little bit, comes back to the probe, and the probe interprets that there's liver deeper than there is. So it looks like you have a liver on the other side of the diaphragm, or on the other side it could be a spleen. So this is what we call the mirror sign. So if you have a mirror image of the liver on the other side of the diaphragm, or a mirror image of the spleen on the other side of the diaphragm, that means that there was air there at that interface the normal lung was up at the diaphragm and that acoustic impedance between the two layers was too great, create, set up a resonance and created an artifact of a mirror image. So lack of black is usually air and that's normal. The other thing I want you to note here is something called the spine sign. So um, you can see the vertebral shadows all the way up to the diaphragm, right? And then they disappear. So why do you think that is? Does air conduct ultrasound well? No, because the air, the ultrasound is trying to get through the lung to see that what's behind the lung, and the air will scatter everything, so not, you're not going to get a signal from what's behind the lung if there's air. If there's fluid, you'll sometimes, and many times, see the spine continuing further up. 
Okay, normal or not? Not, and you can almost see that there's um, some, some uh, settling of content. This is a hemothorax, so instead of just plain fluid, which would appear all black, there's a grayish kind of layering effect to it, and that's because there's red blood cells in, in blood, and if they sit there long enough, they will settle out, and the plasma comes to the top, so you have this gradient, which appears, what blood appears like. And on the other side, we have a mirror image. That's normal. That's an aerated lung with no fluid. Um, I will, I've mentioned transudative versus exudative effusion in hemothorax. Sometimes you can tell the nature of the effusion and it, tells, it guides your management. For instance, if you're thinking about just putting a very thin needle into um, effusion to drain it in a thoracentesis, you might not choose to do that if you have something that looks very thick with fibrinous loculations or, or blood in it because you need to manage those differently. So it does help. It's not diagnostic. You should never say this is transudate versus exudate based on what the ultrasound looks like. Um, because you, you, know, you need to send it to the lab to be sure, but you can pretty much tell when you look at it if you're gonna need a needle or a chest tube to drain it. So it's very helpful for that. Notice on that bottom uh, right image of the transudate, you can see the spine shadow behind that fluid. You see, see the spine sign? Okay. Um, we also use the, uh, the probe in real time with a sterile flub or a sterile cover on it to guide uh, to guide procedures. Um, many times people will just mark it with an X and then reposition the patient in about the same position and hope for the best. But I think if you've got the ultrasound available to you, it's best to use it in real time because look at all the vital organs that are pretty close to where you're gonna be putting a pretty large bore needle. So unless you, you really want to get a spleen or a liver biopsy, it's probably a good idea if you have the ultrasound to use the ultrasound while you're doing the procedure to guide you can actually see the needle going into the fluid, knowing to stop pushing. Just gives you an idea. Okay. Okay. See my needle. Um, from the fluid and air. All right, we got your needle here. This is not used as common. These are ICU is becoming more popular. Um, like I said, the European groups, uh, Liechtenstein and so forth, use chest X-ray almost exclusively to diagnose consolidation. Chest, I mean, sorry, use ultrasound almost exclusively, and chest x-ray is less popular. So pneumonia on a chest x-ray looks like patchy, multi-lobar, sometimes um, infiltrates. You don't know what the infiltrates are. You can't say it's infection. You could, it could be blood, contusion, tumor, but you have an infiltrate. And what, what is common amongst all infiltrates is that whatever is in the lung is replacing the air. So you can imagine that those normal air artifacts are gonna be changed when you have um, a pneumonia or consolidation in the lung. So the other substance, whether it's fluid, pus, solid tumor, will allow the ultrasound waves to go deeper into the thorax and you're gonna see more of the lung itself. And inside the lung tissue, things have different, different echogenic properties. For instance, the bronchi have more connective tissue in them, so you're gonna see brighter white lines for bronchi. Um, if the lung is severely consolidated, it will actually end up looking like liver. We call that hepatization of the lung, which is just a term meaning it's really socked in. Uh, pneumonia it almost looks like a solid organ, and those patients are generally in pretty serious trouble. Some examples um, of what it can look like. So if you image into the lung, and instead of seeing A lines or B lines, you see something that looks like a little bit like liver with bright white horizontal lines going through it then that is lung with, with air bronchi, or with bronchograms, basically. The bright white is the connective tissue of the bronchi. You're able to see them because solid has replaced air, and you're able to actually image the lung in these circumstances. Some other examples, a still picture. This is a, at, the, um, at, at the costophrenic recess. You can see the diaphragm all the way to the right of the picture, the lingula of the lung, uh, the the pointy area of the lung, the lung is fairly socked in so it looks solid. You can actually see it. And the fluid around it, which is probably a parademonic effusion or an empyema. And the, um, even in the, when you use the higher frequency probe and you don't get that much of a picture of the lung, you can appreciate in that, even just in the two centimeters of the lung you can see in the high frequency probe, it looks gray, doesn't look black. And that's a consolidation. Again, normal lung, A lines, you don't really see the lung itself, you see the artifact as, as opposed to pneumonia, where you can see the lung, the bronchi, 
and it almost looks like a solid organ. So if you, you, if you go in all eight of your quadrants, basically, and quadrant on both sides, you might be able to even say this is a right upper lobe infiltrate and compare that with your chest x-ray because not everybody has full, and it's a good thing, not everybody has full pneumonia on both sides. You might have a, one lobe affected on either side, and you can start to hone your skills by trying to find it and then comparing it to the chest x-ray. And here's a good example of a bronchogram. So if you have fluid in the bronchi, the fluid appears black, but the walls of the bronchi appear bright white, and you can actually see the outline of the bronchi. And fluid is usually inflammatory or, or white cells. And lastly, I'll mention that um, if you put Doppler on a consolidated lung, it tends to be more hypervascular, but it's hard to, there's not a definitive you know, number we're looking for. It's just if you compare it to a non-consolidated part of the lung, there's more vascularity to a pneumonia. Other things we can see are abscesses, very discrete collections of fluid within the lung. <coughs> this is a, an example of a, a lung abscess after significant necrotizing pneumonia. Here's another great example of, you can actually see the outline of the entire bronchus through ultrasound because the lung is so consolidated. Just, okay, we're gonna wrap up. Um, we're gonna remind you that you wanna scan all areas of the chest if you are to look for comet tails, you wanna look for them in diffusely, multiple, going all the way to the edge of the screen. You will not likely see them in our normal models today, but if you want to see them, join us in the ICU any day. Um, and you wanna look for, with pulmonary edema, you're expecting bilateral positivity. Uh, the, this is the, the stars represent the, the rib shadows, the pleural line is where the arrows are, and just another example of what comet tails look like. Reminder that the comet tails are an artifact. They're just because there's resonance set up at that interface between air and water that, and that sound wave just reverberates infinitely and creates this vertical artifact. And pneumothorax, a reminder before we go to our models that sky ocean beach and sliding is what we're looking for in a normal lung. Lack of sliding and barcode and, based, and definitely lack of bee lines would what we, what we expect to see in the pneumothorax. So when you go to your scanning today, um, it won't take you, you'll all become experts within about 10 minutes. Um, it won't take you long. You wanna make sure you identify, you, you use your, for, your um, high frequency probe, you identify rib shadows in the pleural line, watch through several cycles of breathing, put an M-mode line through the pleural line, ask your model to hold the breath, ask them to breathe and see how it looks different so you can see Sky Ocean Beach and barcode. And then with whatever time, um, uh, do it also with the P21 probe. The P21 probe um, is, uh, is a cardiac probe. You can see deeper and you're not gonna, the pleural line's gonna be way at the top of the screen so it's not gonna give you the detail but it gives you some, it gives you also an idea of whether any B lines, B lines are better seen with the P21 probe. So go back and forth between probes, but pneumothorax, you definitely wanna use the high frequency probe. And with what time you have left, practice your views of that pleural space, look for fluid in the pleural space, um, Morrison's pouch, you know, splenorenal recess, and anything else that you feel like you need to review, because you'll have extra time today. Any questions?